Choppy starts blushing, oh, and he's oh, also blushing. All excited because Thomas Dimitrov sits down. I, th <laughs> I didn't know which. I didn't know it was going to be a compliment or insult. Choppy, how did you take it? Oh, that's a compliment. Okay, that's a compliment. Yeah, it's a yeah, compliment. Absolutely. What'd you say to him? Well, I, look, I just said, look, you look like you've been doing some lat work or whatever it was a bench. I didn't know if he could bench <laughs> off with Jay Glazer, <laughs> but we know how important it is to maintain age, right? It's no yes. longer just get on a treadmill. You got to lift. Got to. You got to. You got to. If you don't move, if you don't use it, yeah. you lose it, right? Yes. You right. got to move. You got to move right. around. That's Before right. we dive into all the numbers and stuff, I, I, I want to pick your brain about a couple of league topics. Dan Quinn, our former defensive coordinator, goes to D.C. How do you think that fit is, and, uh, and how do you think Dan Quinn will do? Really excited for Dan because I think Dan is going to pair with Adam Peters, who's a first-time general manager. Usually a first-time general manager is a little sketchy about coming in there with a really experienced coach because they're wondering, you know, it's, it's, it's Adam Peters' first time to be in charge of everything, right? He's paired with the perfect person. He, he has experience, not only as a you know, really good coordinator, but as a head coach. And Dan Quinn loves personnel. So that's music to the ears and, and, and he loves personnel, but not in a way that he's going to be muscling people. Dan's not that. I just think it's going to be a good mix. We want Mike Zimmer to replace Dan Quinn. Choppy wants to go with the youth movement. What are your thoughts on who should replace the very nice job that DQ did with the Cowboys? Well, who is the youth movement? Who are you thinking? It's a great question. I don't know. Okay. I, 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 guy, he's an ageist. I don't, I, don't, I don't offer solutions. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I, I, don't, I don't offer solutions. I, to I, I, I think what would, what would the youth movement be? This would, Adam Dirty, probably, who, oh, who yeah. is in Atlanta, and, sure. and is somebody really well thought of by the players here in Dallas. That's a good point. Is Adam ready? I mean, Matt or Dan Quinn raves about him. That's why he had him there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he is a guy to consider. I mean, Zim's going to come in there, and he's going you know, to have that old school side of him. Is that what that defense needs? I don't know. You have a you have a linebacker there. What is, is you guys call him a linebacker? I know he's no. been in it three years no. and he's seen it all. I think that's what I heard. I don't know. Right. What happens? I mean, when you bring in an old school guy, uh, really right. smart, right? How do they respond? How does that group respond? And then your former team, the Atlanta Falcons, were the most tied to Belichick. <clears throat> why didn't the Atlanta Falcons hire Bill Belichick? And why are Bill Belichick and Mike Vrabel? not coaching uh blown away by that first of all uh, even in the league whether i had 90 10 on my board every day of the the run towards bill potentially going to atlanta i'm like he's going to atlanta he and he and arthur i know both of them well i thought they could both pair well together you know and, I, and yet you guys know who rich mckay is right yeah so rich is there but but rich was ready to and, and Arthur said, like, Rich is moving up to see a CEO of AMBSE, which is sports and entertainment. He was not going to be involved in it. But there still was going to be an internal office there in called the way it is, right? There's a survival mode in this league to make sure that things go the way it is. Bill's going to come in and all rights, whether you, whether you like his style or not, he deserves as a Hall of Fame number one coach in the league to have full control. And full control. Full control. Now, but know, his draft record in New right. England recently doesn't show that. Well, full control is let's bring in the right people around me to make sure. And I think Bill understood that. I, I mean, I don't know that, but I believe at this point at 72, Bill's going to come in and say, I want A, B, and C in my building. I want my directors. I don't know if that meant bringing back Scott Pioli, John Robinson. There's a lot of us who, are, who had been in that organization with Bill in New England who have gone on to do really good things. Some guys, Jason Light, still at Tampa. So maybe he wanted that. But remember... Bill's going to have that say, so I think that's important. Uh, Thomas Dimitrov, Eric Eager joining us here on 105.3 The Fan. Did you all buy the report that Mike Vrabel's too physically intimidating? <laughs> to be? I think I could take this as <laughs> a part of Sumer as, as a fellow big. Uh, other, than, other than in an airplane, there's no disadvantage to being tall. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Like, I, I don't buy it at all. I mean, don't, I, Thomas, I mean, you, Vrabel, Vrabel has been a great coach in this league. Took a 2021. Wait a minute, great? I, I I'm a semantically responsible. I keep telling you that. Great? If you take Ryan Tannehill to the okay. AFC Championship game, I'm going to give <laughs> okay. a superlative to you. I Maybe not great, <laughs> okay. but 2021 they had the one seed in the AFC with – they played the most players in the NFL due to injuries and COVID. I, I, think the, I think the issue is coming down to a lot of – and this has been the theme in the NFL offseason is how well do you work with others, right? You, John Robinson – you know, that, that was a, a fractured relationship, ended up being a divorce there. Uh, Rand Carthon comes in. 
you know, reports are that that one didn't work out either. When you have two, you know, one and a half years where you've been the the, you know, the grand poobah somewhere and the wins haven't been there, people are going to start questioning And that. this is my point about great very quickly. If you are great, you can weather that storm. If you're very good or good, I mean, that's. I think he's still developing. I'm blown away he's not doesn't have a job. I th- right. You know, this guy is a very good football coach, but he's got a, a power element to him. And if you're a general manager and that's not what you're looking for, if you're, or if your ownership is not looking for it, to your point, yeah. it's, it's Can tough. you be that hard ass with these players today? Like, again, we want Mike Zimmer. Can you do that? Or is Micah Parsons and others going to be asking out of town requests? I, I personally think, and I can throw it over to you, I believe you can be that way. But you have to be understanding and do the proper patting on the back, and you have to, you have to, you have to be empathic. To an extent, I, in think, my mind. I think you need balance. I mean, I think Mike Zimmer's biggest failure in Minnesota was, you know, you see it now with with Kevin O'Connell the way he treats Kirk Cousins. Kevin O'Connell makes Kirk Cousins feel like the franchise quarterback. Yeah. Mike Zimmer, I, I felt like the last four years in Minnesota was trying to prove to everybody that Kirk Cousins was a bad decision. Yeah. When you're at defensive coordinator, you're not responsible for those things. You can just cook up a defense, yep. which we know he's brilliant at. You need balance in that room. You need the one guy that's you know, just like in life. You need the one parent that's going to be the parent that you know consoles. You need the one parent who's disciplinary. And I think on a staff, you kind of need that. You can't have all hard asses. You can't have all people who are. Uh, you know, players, coaches, for lack of a better term. What was y'all's shock level that Jerry brought back McCarthy? I was, I was probably a little bit shocked. Yeah, I thought that maybe there was. I always thought that Dan was going to potentially yeah. be that guy. Yeah. Were you, did you guys yes. think that? Was yes. that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Until but, the end. Now okay. people want Dan Quinn out of town. Dan yeah. Quinn was the king, and then second half of the season can't stop the run. A Green Bay torched him, destroyed him. Why are you playing zone, off yeah. coverage, all those things? And now people are ready for Dan Quinn to get run out of town. Yeah. I think also the fact that McCarthy, you know, a lot of times with these great coach, you know, these coaches that have won before, right. you know, Andy Reid and all that, like it, it, Belichick, right? Belichick didn't leave New England because he's a bad coach. Bill Belichick left New England because it was no longer tenable there, you know, and I think for McCarthy, you win 12 games three straight years, you don't get to the conference championship. It's not because you're a bad coach. It's because it's no longer working there. I always thought part of the reason why, you know, McCarthy could leave is because he would have another option, and, and that could have been, you know, his hometown of Pittsburgh one day if Tomlin ever leaves, something like that. We're talking with Eric Eager and Thomas Dimitrov here on 105 Through the Fan. Okay, Eric, so I got the uh, the analytics question for you because we, we have this debate all the time about analytics, and it's something that, you know, we it feels like we're in our money ball era for the NFL a little bit where there's still yeah. the old guard digging in and, and, and wanting things a certain way and, and, and eye test stuff. One of the ones that I've found seems to be a dividing line right now is there's a lot of folks in the analytics community who would say Justin Herbert is a better quarterback than Joe Burrow. And it seems that there's a lot of people who approach and say, no, like just if you watch and you watch results, Burrow's clearly better. There's not even a discussion. They're not on the same tier. How do you approach that question specifically, just Herbert versus Burrow? I'm curious what you, how you view, you view them as quarterbacks and how they're tiered and how you reconcile trying to be able to – tie analytics to say hey look this this is a better indicator rather than just the results on the surface that you see yeah because the results would would paint a better picture for burrow than herbert especially if you look at team results and i do believe that quarterbacks bear i do believe that you have to look at whether or not your team wins when you evaluate a quarterback because um you know analytics can't explain everything and so there there are missing you know whether or not a team wins there are missing explanations that i think a quarterback has some you know, responsibility over. And so I think Burrow deserves some plaudits there. Now, one of the reasons why I believe that Herbert is deserves at least a discussion to be uh, better than Burrow is what happens when they're hurt. You know, Justin Herbert played an entire season with broken ribs and was able to win 10 games, was able to keep that offense afloat because of his sheer physical ability, the fact that he's a big, strong, fast kid, that he's getting hit all the time. Every time Joe Burrow has been nicked up and hurt, that Bengals offense, I mean, he set a record in the month of September for the lowest yards per pass attempt when he had a hurt calf. And that's why guys like Thomas will tell you, like, if I had an opportunity to pick a big, strong, fast quarterback and a quarterback who's maybe like a little bit more of a middling guy from a physicality standpoint, I'm always going to take the big, fast, strong guy, all things, all things equal, because there are those intangible elements to it. So I think even though the statistics aren't there, you know, if you, after you adjust for context, I think I think Herbert does end up being uh, at least you know sort of on par with Burrow, even though the results so far haven't indicated that. What was y'all's reaction to JJ Watt 
destroying some of the analytics. George Kittle <laughs> talking about momentum not being factored in. We'll get into the whole Lions scenario. What was your reaction to, to those comments? I just I think it's short-sighted, and I respect the players in this league. And I think it's not that complicated. Take the data, supplement, or augment your abilities. If you're a kick-ass football person, why would you not fold in the analytics to help you become that much better. I'm a believer it makes, in our situation, it makes a good GM very good. It makes a very good, potentially a Hall of Famer. And I would say the same for a head coach. Why in the world would you not look at it? In the end, it's up to you to make that decision, Dan Campbell, do we kick this or not? Why has momentum not been able to be figured out? Or has it been and we just don't, I don't well, really know I think Well, I think that there are just so few games and, and also it's just like we don't define it well. Right. It, it's sort of it's it's it gets in this religious realm. It's like how you define this. It's like, well, you know, it means different things to different people. Momentum means, you know, momentum for the Lions could have meant like, well, you know, you came out of the half slow because did the Niners just like actually did they adapt their scheme in the second half and run all over you? Or did you come out of the half a little down because you give up? Like, I think momentum is just poorly defined. And so. From a math standpoint, if you don't have a good definition of something, you can't actually prove it exists. And so I think that that's mostly the issue. I think most people who've played sports before know that there's an element of, like, the hot hand, for example. For years, people said the hot hand didn't exist. And if you redefine the question, there is a little bit of evidence for the hot hand. And anybody that's shot baskets before in basketball knows that, like, once you actually sort of get the groove going, you're better off than if you go in cold. And so, you know, it just amounts to defining it properly and and – I, I think it's overused, but I, I do obviously believe it exists because there, there needs to be uh, – it just needs to be properly defined. I want to ask you a GM question. I've been dying to know. This came up. This comes up all yeah. the time on our show. It came up recently with Jerry and Steven, and Steven maybe not knowing a player in the draft uh, in maybe doing a deal with Detroit. Talking actual, like, X's and O's, I, I can't – do that me and choppy don't do that you know there's zone blitz and who's going where and left and right do you know does every general manager know all of that verbiage or is it okay the scout brings me the player i make the numbers work what how far does the football knowledge x and x's and o's wise go with a gm I think in today's world, it's imperative that your relationship with your head coach is very sound. So those moments that I'm able to bring in Dan Quinn into my office and ask him questions about his scheme, uh, specifically the type of player we need in that sort of a scheme, is very, very important. We dissuade all of our personnel people from digging too deep into the scheme. That gets that when when you have a, an ex coach who comes in and learns to try to scout, and he's sitting there popping off talking about this scheme and that scheme, we we pull our hair out as as evaluators, right? We're like, pay attention to the player, the nuance of the player, the athleticism, the movement, blah blah blah, all of that. So we keep it in perspective. You need to know generally what your team is playing. Not that you need to spend eighty hours on your your playbook. You just need to be conversant with your head coach as a GM. That's very, very important. Well, that's, that's in every collaborative setting, right? Like, you, yeah. you don't know what the ADA is on my algorithm, but you know what my algorithm <laughs> is doing. And I don't know kind of what you're looking for in a cornerback turning his hips, but I know that you're looking for him turning his hips, right? Like, that's sort of every collaborative setting. But when you're watching a game yourself, are you saying in every play, okay, they're in cover one. Okay, they're did it out. The, 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 no. You're no, not. we're not. We're not. We are. We are. Over. As a GM, when you're watching a football yeah. game, or when you did yeah. with the Falcons, yeah, I'm watching. I am watching the players. I am not watching scheme. I'll fold in scheme as we're going and saying, okay, he's doing this. Yeah. I see where where they are, and he's got responsibility here. But, but you know all that. Yeah, you know it. You, and every yes. like Jerry Jones. Do you think him and Stephen Jones? know all that I, I can't comment on that but there are some that aren't football people necessarily and they have business you know look you can look at howie roseman howie roseman has done a great job in philly you guys probably don't want to talk about philly but he has <laughs> oh, because, we will worry now they're crumbled crumbled yeah right that's <laughs> exactly right no i get that not that we could talk that yeah much. but you know what i mean he's learned he's a he's a learned guy just like mickey loomis is down in new orleans he was a business guy how he comes in as a legal guy and they grow to learn more about football so that's that, you have to know enough um, I think if you're in that role and you're not, you don't have a background of football, I think it's... Thomas Dimitrov, Eric Eager from Sumer Sports. So I'm going to fight with you here. Oh, okay. I think <laughs> Choppy has gotten me in years past to abandon the running back, the <laughs> linebacker, 
safety, D tackle. I'm still there, running back, I don't care. But the Dallas Cowboys have a problem with all these other things. Toughness, he rolls his eyes. Run defense, he says doesn't matter. Don't ever draft a linebacker unless they're going to rush a passer. If Michael Parsons was a linebacker, hell no. Go get someone else. So I'm going old school, if you want to call it that. Toughness. I got Run defense. How, how, how's your heart rate? <laughs> no, and I tell mean, me why that's <laughs> right or wrong. So how many rushing yards did the Niners give up the last two weeks? Kind of quite a few, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and the Chiefs are – I think the Chiefs are like – it depends upon what metric, but they're bottom half of the league comfortably in rushing yards allowed, right? And second in points allowed. I don't think they've allowed more than 28 all year. Like I, so I get what you're saying. Yeah. I, I, like, and by the way, I'll push back. And like, what, this is one cool thing that analytics has done. Which, But what, how did Detroit get a lot of that lead in the first half against San Fran in a game that they arguably should have won? They ran the football down their throat. Mm-hmm. And San, right? Yeah, exactly. I, and San I, Fran couldn't stop it. But when the but so what openings do you have? Assume or sports for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But the run the, the issue with the run game. So I'm going to turn this back to Kansas City because it's sort of the, the 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 cool narrative in this game. Kansas City is a middle of the pack team in the NFL mm-hmm. in allowing first downs to turn into other first downs. Meaning they're they're not that good at at producing three and outs. They don't like turn. They're not like hey it's second and nine because they stuff the run. They're really good though at. Because the run game is, and you guys know this because of Pollard, it's four, four, four. It doesn't. That's not how it works. It's seven, which pisses everybody off. It's three, two, and then all you need is the defense is to go two, two, and then now you're in third and eight, and now you're the sports book, and they're the better out there, you know, about to pay minus one ten, and and that's how you play defense in the NFL, and it and it's it doesn't feel good, right? It feels soft, but that's how you sort of win in the NFL. Now the the hard part is there are levels to this, and you know, we've seen in analytics over the past few years, the one reason that, that scoring is down in the NFL is last year NFL teams on offense were really, really good at running against light boxes. This year, against six- and seven-man boxes, NFL teams have decreased yards per carry by like half a yard. Teams are learning to draft the Jordan Davises. They're learning to draft the Travis Joneses of Baltimore uh, out of UConn in that same draft. And they're able to be sturdy with lighter box. They're not, they don't have to pull the safety down to actually stop the run. So I think you're right in, this, in the sense of to play modern defense, you do need to play coverage. But you do need to have a sturdy run-defending defensive lineman do that. And so I would say defensive tackle is out of that list of, like, linebacker safety, running back, tight end, of non-premium positions. Defensive tackle is a premium position. It's why in the marketplace you saw a ton of Javon Hargrave's deal, Dexter Lawrence's deal, all those deals that are now rivaling edge because defenses, you need to be able to two-gap and, and rush the passer from that position because you don't have that third safety in the box coming up and play – or third – yeah, that safety in the box coming up and playing the run. Where is because I mean we hear a lot about what analytics can do for team building and roster building. What is the greatest limitation analytics has right now, present day analytics in terms of roster building? In my opinion, it's it's injury prediction. Like I think if you huh. if you can really do, it's just so the data availability is tough. Um, it's it's and 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 it kills these teams. And and if you look at my world before then was in sports betting. All the really sharp sports bettors are ones that can incorporate injury information the fastest. That's how you win now, um, and and in the, and Thomas could probably expound, expound more quickly. Well, I love the injury side, but I'm a big believer. Like, how are we ever going to tap into that that passion? You know, the stuff that we know is so important to put together a team. We're working on some of those algorithms yeah. where maybe it's three and four levels away from it, but maybe it ties into passion and and efforts uh, that we can't norm we can normally measure, of course. All right, wanted to get you guys your, your takes on, on, on what happened in that San Fran-Detroit game with the second half, the going forward on fourth downs. What did you all think about that? And did you have, and was the one before halftime arguably the most egregious or, or the least? So the one before halftime is the most defensible, but I will say as somebody who's in analytics and wants to talk about momentum, I actually would have gone for it for that reason because if you're up 21, I think 21 is a way more insurmountable lead than 17. And I would have, so if you're going in at 21, that is one where you can legitimately start to plan about like this, the number of runs you have, the clock, everything like that. If you're up 14 and they're getting the ball to start the half, you're in there and you're like, guys, we could lose. Like this is a, a legitimate thing. 
17 to me feels like a, a lead that's safe enough to, to let off the gas pedal, but evidently not safe enough, right? right? And so that's why I didn't like it. I think the math would, the math was kind of a coin flip on that one. But to me, that's why I would have went for it because I think the actual upside of missing it is you make sure that everybody goes into the half knowing, like, this is a real football game. I know you've played the game of your life so far, but you're not out of the woods yet. Whereas I think at 17 you're like, you're like, oh, yeah, we're still in a, you know, it's still three scores when in reality it's like a kind of a Mickey Mouse three scores, I think. Who, who are the best and worst teams or organizations this year at incorporating all this stuff that you all believe in? Um, or just if you want to talk about who's the best and worst overall in the league right now. Well, the, the, Lions, the Lions added 1.04 wins on just in-game decisions. So timeouts. The other one was kickoff rule, right? Now that they give you the chance to fair catch kickoffs, you should kick the ball through the end zone fair catch for a couple of reasons, right? One of them is injuries. Every time you run a kickoff out of the end zone, every time you kick it short, you're going to kill your depth incrementally every time there's an injury or two. So in the NFL, you should just kick the ball through the end zone and fair catch every kickoff because you want your depth pieces, the guys that Thomas puts on the roster, you want them healthy for all 17 games. And then there's timeout avoidance, delay of games. You know, Sean McVay, the reason they lost that game by one is when Detroit had the ball at the end, he was powerless to stop the clock. Mm-hmm. Dan Campbell this year added over a win to the Detroit Lions by, by manipulating. And I know people don't want to hear that now after that San Francisco game, but he added over a win to Detroit's ledger by those decision makers. Thomas, we'll finish up with this. Thomas and Dimitrov, Eric Eager, Dimitrov, former NFL GM from Sumer Sports. Your experiences with having a quote-unquote lame duck coach and what that does to the locker room, if it does anything, and hiring an assistant here to replace Dan Quinn. I tell Mike Zimmer, I tell Ron Rivera, yeah, we're all, we might be on shaky ground here with Mike McCarthy, with everyone thinking he's a lame duck. Your experience in the league with that status? It's complicated. Uh, if you throw it's down, definitely a factor. Yeah, it's a factor. If you throw down enough money, you get the guys in, and you realize that somehow you have to game plan and work through that. And it comes down to your, your lame duck coach, so to speak, and how he's going to navigate through it, meaning where his personality, where his uh, energy is. That's a really important thing. If a team sees that, it's, you know, if they see the dragging of the dauber and the, the bad interaction between certain coaches because a head coach sometimes that's in that spot, they're going to have an acute eye towards some of the people in the building. Like, ah, that guy's been next to the owner a little bit too much, right? You get this ultimate paranoia that mm-hmm. sets in. That's a bad thing, of course, because the, the team feels it and everyone's looking at the coach thinking, He's worried. He's edgy. And that can happen. I've been around it before with Mike Smith, who's a hell of a coach. I mean, Mike Smith, three-time coach a year in five years. But that last year was complicated, right? You're always looking. And as a GM, you're looking at it very closely to try to try to mitigate. And it's not easy to do. Where can we go and find more of y'all's info? Sumersports.com. We have a big game breakdown, 41 pages with all the statistics, all the uh, uh, prop bets you could ever want. So Sumersports.com, big game preview uh, on our website. Fellas, thank you so much. Fascinating yet again. And we appreciate you joining us on the Home of the Cowboys. Every year. Let's do it. Have us here. Thank you, Jeff. How do you think RJ will look next year? (laughs) Uh, He might might cut up a little bit. (laughs) I I need to. Trust me. Trust me. Holy cow. (laughs) Thank you, fellas. (laughs) 